Hello, my name is Mark Halbig. I'm a behavior support specialist with the Albuquerque Public Schools. And today we're going to do two parts of a presentation about online classroom management for secondary teachers. Um, we've learned quite a bit in these two months and in case we have to come back to a similar setup in the fall, we wanted to just share some tips and things we've heard from other teachers and things we've learned during this time. So on our agenda today, first we'll be talking about our own mindset and then we'll look at Google Meet and some of its limits and recording rules. Establishing relationships online and this will have to do with the social and emotional learning that will be is so important during this time. Meeting expectations and setting a structure for the meeting. Part two, you can see that highlighted in red there. Those are things that will be discussed in the second part of this video. So let's talk about our mindset. And the purpose of this is a reflection piece. It's not to kind of dwell on all the things that went wrong in this two months, because we need to put the context of the situation there. So think back to your teaching and where you were on March 11th and how comfortable you were right before we found out we were taking the three week pause before deciding if schools were going to resume. And now think of your teaching in May and think of how much it's changed. Think of maybe how much you've learned that you didn't know on March 11th, especially on the technology side, what has worked well, what hasn't. And in terms of keeping that reflection mindset, let's put the situation in context. Everyone, students and teachers, is dealing with someone with a situation they haven't dealt with before. We know there are severe limits on what teachers can do. For example, students were told this wasn't mandatory. Grades didn't count. Right there, that put a lot of limits on what teachers could do. Then you have things in Google Meet that we'll talk about that put limits on teachers being able to manage the online setting. So we're overcoming a major learning curve, maybe in our own skill sets, as a district, as a country. My boss likes to say we threw together an education shanty town, and now we're trying to build a more solid structure for the fall. And we weren't given much time to deal with this. We had that two, three week period that included spring break, but then it was off to the races for the most part. And so everybody's been learning on the fly. And so we wanna give ourselves that grace and forgiveness during this time period and not be so hard on ourselves, but instead reflect, how can I be better in the fall? So what behaviors are teachers seeing? Well, you can see the list there. And while I think most people have been dealing with more general disruptiveness, like maybe the misuse of chat or um, just students blocking cameras and you don't know what they're doing or just talking out of turn, we have had some pretty serious behaviors. And so no matter if we're in the classroom or online, what teachers have told us, what we've learned is the three R's are making the difference. And we're not talking reading, we're talking relationships, routines and rituals. And so a lot of the things we would discuss on a classroom setting as good classroom management principles, they apply to the online setting. They just look and sound different. So here's some questions to consider as we move forward. And there's a couple I wanna really focus on. What is the best way to present material online? Is Google Meet gonna be the way to go? Reflect on that. What have you been doing? Have you been recording lessons? But what's the best way moving forward so we get the material out there in the best way possible while minimizing disruptions? Student ownership, we're gonna talk a lot about in part one here, okay? How can we transfer what we know and how can we learn new skills that to enhance and improve our online setting teaching? Okay. Relationship building, that's a big one. That's very difficult to do in this online setting. So what are some tips we could use to improve that? And student accountability. So let's talk about Google Meet. Let's get some of the basics out of the way. Can you record Google Meet sessions? If your main purpose is to keep a record for yourself, 
then that is perfectly acceptable to record Google Meet sessions, especially if you're monitoring behavior and you want a record of what behaviors were taking place. If your purpose is to share information like posted on Google Classroom or on a class website, talk to your administrator because there are some question marks there about privacy. You're seeing into people's homes. You're seeing all students if you have like a grid view. So uh, best check with your administrator. The other thing, tell students you're recording. Okay, if they want to choose that privacy, they can have that option to block the camera and not be recorded, but let them know beforehand. What are some limits? I'm sure you're all well aware of the limits of Google Meet sessions. And a lot of it has to do with those accountability controls. Students can unmute themselves. We've had students take over presentations and share sexually inappropriate material. Teachers not having control of the chat, not being able to disable those features. If you end a call early because of behavior reasons, those students can stay on the call. They can use old links to get into a call. Okay, They don't need permission, your permission to enter. So there's some liability there. And if you remove a student, like you've gone through a lot of steps and you've eventually removed them, they can rejoin and there's not much you can do about it. So acknowledging those limits before we start, those are things that are beyond our control. Hopefully Google Meet will add some new features to give teachers more control, but we have to build around with what control we have. Okay. Now, there are some Google Meet extensions I have found helpful, and the one I have found most helpful is Google Nod. And on Google Nod, what you would see is, and you can see the directions for how to download it, but you would have these three tabs at the top with the thumbs up, the hand raised, and the setting wheel. And so basically, as you're going through a meeting, if a cl student clicked on the thumb, they would get all these other emojis. So you could ask a question after you present. Okay, does that part make sense? I need a thumbs up or thumbs down. If you have a question at this time, please raise your hand and the students could hit that tab and it would show everybody who has Google Nod who's raising their hand. So instead of looking at all the individual screens, the teacher could say, okay, Ashley, I see you raised your hand. You're next to ask a question. We use these in our own meetings. It's very helpful for keeping it kind of orderly, organized, making sure people are on the same page. It makes it much easier for the moderator. This is something at the beginning of a Google Meet session. You could have students go through the directions and download this. Grid view gives you a view of everybody at once. So that can be helpful as opposed to just seeing like five people off to the side, you can see everyone. Google attendance, I suggest watching the Google attendance video. It's about five minutes. Some people have had troubles with this working. I personally haven't had to use it, but some say if you really follow the directions carefully that you can, uh, it works well. So that's something else to consider. And there are others out there uh, there's plenty of Google Meet, ex Google Chrome extensions that you can research and see if something you find useful. So let's talk about the continuous learning plan. And one of the keys we want to focus on is the social and emotional learning. And you can see the five parts of social and emotional learning. A lot of times in the secondary setting, we think of these as something a counselor would come in and do a one or two day session in someone's classroom. In reality, we need to incorporate these skills into our everyday teaching. And when you look at the five, you can think of how valuable they are on an everyday basis. We want them to be responsible decision makers. We want them to be able to self-manage social awareness, how others are affected by their behavior, self-awareness. So all of these are keys. The key is how do we incorporate them into our everyday classroom? And that doesn't mean we do a 20 minute lesson every day on social emotional learning. We build it into like our, if they're playing a game in class, 
if assignments are due on that self-management piece. We can build it into our regular content and curriculum. Google Meet, one of its ways that we can very well use it is to build those relationships and build these social skills. So we'll talk about some tips on how to do that coming up. So what are some activities that you can do in social to teach social and emotional learning skills in the online setting? One way I've seen teachers and heard teachers do is just a discussion prompt. For example, one thing that has been good about my week this past week has been. So instead of asking secondary students, so what are you thinking? How are you feeling? If you can set it up in a smaller group and have a discussion prompt where they have something very specific to answer, and we wanna, then that makes it easier for them to share. And it's good to focus on gratitude and things we're thankful for during this time because it's easy to get caught up in the negative of this. So building time in our session for these student discussions, whether it's a discussion prompt like we just mentioned, or it's student discussions about the actual content, those are ways that we can build in social emotional learning. Probably one of my favorites as a social teacher was bullet three there on nonfiction content related stories. There are so many stories like personal stories out there where we could talk about the empathy we have for this person or different points of view that come about from this story, then that's that social awareness key of having awareness of how things affect others. And so you can see if we just throw in a couple questions like that in addition to what happened to the person, then that's ways we can use our content to provide these examples. Like we mentioned, instead of just discussion prompts, you can give them share one thing that's been like an artifact, one thing that's been important to you during this coronavirus time period. Okay, and that's a way for students to share. Positive videos. I like the Steve Hartman videos, and even though these were designed for younger students, these can be very helpful. There are videos he has that do address middle school and secondary students that um, they can use and have that discussion about someone else's life and how it connects to them. So there's an example of a middle school football team who set themselves up to score a touchdown for a special needs student. That is something students can engage in. Instead of just worksheets on our assignments, how can we let them express themselves through their drawings, through their music? How can we get creative? That builds this in. So probably one of the toughest parts of the online setting has been the building relationships. So here's some tips on how to do this. First, no matter what's happening, staying calm and showing empathy for the situation. Help students feel that personal connection. Sharing your own struggles during this time period, they can connect to that. That helps with that relationship building. I know a teacher who played Kahoot. It's an online game that a lot of teachers play in the classroom. It'll work on the online setting. And he did a Star Wars one. And so it was more just about the class having some fun together. It wasn't even academic related, but you can do both. Structured choice, giving them choices on the assignment, letting them have some buy-in like on the next bullet, student input and feedback on expectations. That's gonna get covered in a moment in more depth. If you need to, meet individually with certain students or set your class into smaller groups. Instead of having one on a one hour session for 40 students, maybe you have four 15 minute sessions, okay, with 10 students each. That makes it much, gives the students more equity in having their voices heard. They get a chance to know you better in that smaller setting. So why is getting student input and feedback so important? And sorry that the titles here are covered, but we'll manage. And it's just, like we said, it's a learning curve. Well, especially online, we said we don't have all those controls we'd like in Google Meet. So approaching it from a being respectful point of view and those life skills of how to treat each other can help minimize behavior if they start to internalize and see Yes, I see how my behavior is affecting everyone else. 
And while I'm having some struggles with this, there's other ways to deal with that. So the more they have a role in developing the expectations and norms, not only will they buy into it more themselves, but it also makes it more likely they'll hold each other accountable. Students are gonna behave more when they see the choice in things than the punishment of things. So I'm muting you because you won't stop talking. While that can be effective, okay, and may sometimes need to be built in, if we provide some choice before that on their behavior or show them the choice that they're making and how it's affecting others, that's going to be more likely to work than just muting, especially with the limits of Google Meet where they can just unmute themselves. So now we've talked about the social emotional part of it. Let's talk some about structure and setting meeting expectations. So one thing we have to consider, this is completely new. Maybe we set expectations in the classroom, but did we set them in the online setting from the beginning? And that can be very difficult to do because we were just, we already knew the group, so we thought we could just transition. We need to teach them how to behave in this setting. And one thing that works well is using real world scenarios. How would you act in a meeting at a job on an online setting? Secondary students have started thinking about that. So that's a good technique to use. Next year, we'll probably need to reestablish expectations for the classroom and online, because it'll been so long since they've been in a physical classroom. But this is a good discussion to have side by side. What do we expect of people in the classroom? Now, how would that look online? So maybe in class, we raise their hands to be heard. Maybe on this, it's using that Google nod. Online, what can we expect people to do with their microphones? Well, if we're in a group of five, there's no reason to mute because it's a small group. There's not the interference. In a group of 40, maybe we need to set that expectation. And we can kind of guide them there, but most of them will be able to come up with these and get there on their own, especially now that they've experienced it. So these meeting expectations, we establish them as a group, we need to continue to communicate them. Before your next online session, send out the expectations again in advance. Post them in a variety of places, Google Classroom, a Google site, if you have a classroom website. Review them at the beginning. A one-time setting expectations and then moving on, isn't enough. They need to hear it again and again. They need to hear it referenced time and again during the meeting, before the meeting, etc. Here are some examples of expectations we may want them to get to. For example, on the chat at the bottom there. If we can establish that the chat is for academic reasons only during the lesson, then we've set some parameters on it. If they don't come up with that on their own, you can guide them there. For example, while I'm presenting, what do you think is a fair expectation for the chat? Only questions about what you're presenting is fair. Or save the chat until after the presentation, then we can write our questions. Okay, those, these are just some examples of at meeting expectations people have used. The other thing that really helps is how you structure the meeting. So break it into chunks, same as you would do in the classroom. You have an agenda. Just tell them what's coming up at the beginning of class. If they know when different things are going to happen, they can kind of organize their mind, and that's that self-regulation, of self, uh, social and emotional learning. Reviewing expectations, having a quick discussion prompt. And that discussion prompt, I mean, if you have 40 kids, you're going to be more limited, but they can type it into chat, okay, and share that way, and everybody can still see. Maybe you set aside just 15 to 20 minutes for the main presentation. You know, high school AP classes, maybe they do need most of the hour for their presentation, but most of us, we should be breaking it up into smaller sections, 15 to 20 minutes. And if they know a break is coming up, they're more likely to not get on chat. 
they're more likely not to mess around on camera. And then we have an elementary teacher, she calls it recess. And their recess is the kids kind of get to do what they want for 10 minutes. Secondary setting, maybe they can chat. You tell them you're there to monitor and you're going to be paying attention to the chat, but if they need to get up and use the restroom, get a drink, build that into that hour and it'll make the time go quicker and help with that self-management. And some type of closing, this is when it's good to get the feedback. What worked today? What didn't? Was there a different way I could do this? We have a learning curve and students, especially if you're honest about it and they, you, they know you're sincere and wanting their input, they'll give you some very good feedback. So this is the end of part one. Um, you can use this slide as different ways to contact the behavior support team. Uh, if you ever need us to meet with you individually, you can see the ticket there. We have our website. Just reach out to us in any way you can, and I will see you shortly for part two. Thank you.